There are 66 books in the Bible, four of which are called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, meaning they all tell a very similar story. The book of Mark was written by a guy named John Mark, and most theologians believe that Mark did most of his writing in Rome, and that's not insignificant. You see, the Jewish people had long awaited the Jewish Messiah, or the Son of God. And during this time, Israel was occupied by Rome, meaning they ruled over the Jewish people. So naturally, they made the conclusion that this Messiah, their Savior, was going to take the Roman Empire by storm, rule victoriously, and with favor toward the Jewish people. But that's not quite how the story goes. Instead of overthrowing the Roman government, that same government turns on Jesus, mocks him as Messiah, kills him and buries him, so that ultimately God can show his plan for humanity. A plan to defeat death and to not just rule an empire, but to set up rule in individual hearts and establish his eternal kingdom. It's the person of God and plan of God, and his name is Jesus. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're here. I am excited to be here with you. Thought there was a chance that I may not make it here this morning because last night, uh, some friends and I, we all went to a Cardinals game together, which was awesome. And did anybody watch the game last night? What an amazing game that was, right? That was fantastic. And uh, after the game, we had a little added excitement because we ended up going back to our car, which was parked in a parking garage, and, and one of the friends that went with us, he had access to this special parking garage that nobody else had access to, and so we got to park in there, and as we were getting ready to leave, we found out that we had been locked in the parking garage, and we couldn't get out. And so we waited there for an hour, trying to figure out how to get out of this thing, and uh, finally we, we ended up Googling the manual for the gate and learning how to operate if we pulled off the access panels, how to get into this thing. Somewhere there is some amazing security footage, and we're, we're going to see if we can get a hold of that, because it's going to be an hour of us pacing around, going to different exits, trying to figure out how we can get out, and then finally, you know, hot wiring this thing. But um, it worked. We got out. What that has to do with today's message? Well, not much. But... We did learn that we had to be flexible. We had to be willing to be adaptable in that moment. We were very adaptable. None of us thought we were going to learn how to you know, redo a, a lift gate or anything like that. So that sort of plays into the story that I'm about to share with you, which is about my wife and I, many years ago, we used to run this missions program called Extreme Impact. And Extreme Impact took lots of people around the world every year to, to do missions in different areas. And so we had teams that were in North America and South America. This was some of our teams one year uh, all together before we went out all over the place. Europe and Asia and Africa and sometimes all at once. And so as you can imagine, taking these teams around the world and, and lots of different people. It took months of training and preparation, and all of the work that went into putting all of this together so that people could, could go and be a part of this. And over the years of doing this, all this training and preparation, we learned the right kind of training to do, the right amount of training. If you gave people too much information, then they wouldn't remember the important stuff. And if you gave them too much information, then they wanted more. They wanted to know every little detail of what was going to happen. And so what we had to teach them to do was to trust their leaders and to stay flexible and to not feel like they had to know everything that was going on because that could actually distract them from what they were there to do in the present. So one of the words that we used, sort of a key phrase that we kind of tried to lodge in their brains before going overseas was the word recalculating. Can everybody say recalculating? Oh, you're good. You know that when you're driving in the car and you're using GPS and you get off course a little bit and that GPS device goes recalculating and sits there, comes up with a new route and gets you back on track, that is the mindset that we wanted them to have. And so when something would go wrong on our trips, and, and we didn't use that right away, but eventually we, we learned to do that, when something would go wrong and it was the type of thing that would normally throw the team off their groove and get everybody upset, no, oh, why is this happening, and no. Someone would yell out, hey, recalculating, and the whole team would remember that and go, oh, yep, that's right, we're just supposed to flow with this and, and get back on track. That was how we tried to teach them. Now, there were still 
several people who felt like it was their expectation, it was our obligation to give them all the details about everything. And so they would come up and ask, and you know, maybe we were at an orphanage, or maybe we were in a park like this, or we would be at a school or something like that, and they would want to know what is happening after this, and what's happening tomorrow, and what's happening the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. And knowing the future became a huge distraction for them. It actually became a problem. They lost their focus on the mission in the present because they were constantly thinking about what was next. In our study of the Gospel of Mark today, we are going to get to peer into what it was like to be part of Jesus' team. And we're going to see that the disciples struggled with the same thing many of our team members struggled with, always wanting to know what's next, what's going to happen, when's this going to happen, tell us more about this, we want more details. And so what Jesus is going to do in our passage today is he's going to redirect them to something more important, more valuable. So open your Bibles to Mark 13. Mark chapter 13, if you want to use the YouVersion Bible app, you can do that. Go to events, go to First Free Church, go to efreebible.org if you want to. efree.org slash Bible, excuse me. efree.org slash Bible. And that will get you the same content that's on the YouVersion app. So however you want to do it, if you want to go there, you're welcome to do that. All of our announcements and things are there as well, so you can see that. As we have been learning in the book of Mark, Jesus was putting his disciples through an extensive training program. He wanted them to be prepared for the mission that they would soon be on after he was removed physically and sent the Holy Spirit in his place to guide them in their hearts. He wanted them to be different than the previous religious leaders. And he told them that. They, they had become distracted by greed and power and status. And so Jesus told the parable of the wicked farmers and how the noble landowner would come and remove those wicked farmers and replace them with good farmers. And that was a parable about the leaders of the religious system in Israel and the temple leaders, how they had become corrupt and would now be replaced by new leaders. The disciples were going to have a mission ahead of them and Jesus wanted them to be ready. But they weren't ready yet. And so they needed a little bit more training. Kevin taught us last week, that God will prepare us for what he has prepared for us. He has prepared things for us to do, and he will prepare us to do those things. And so the disciples have a mission that is prepared for them, and Jesus is trying to prepare them for what he's prepared for them. So we're going to start in verse 1. And we are going to read through all 37. We're going to study all 37 verses of this chapter today. Can you believe that? Do you think we can actually do this in one in one message, 37 verses, that's a lot to go through in a message. Um, and, the, and the truth is, this is a challenging, complicated passage that we're going to wrestle with today. And that's one of the reasons for doing it all in one sermon. There's a lot of stuff here that if we were to try to break it up and do different chunks of it, we could really spend a lot of time on things that, that are not necessarily meant for us to spend a whole ton of time on in a service. So we're going to go through this whole chapter today, and, and you'll get what I'm talking about more as we go through it. It's a, it's a challenging passage, but it's it's going to be worthwhile to study. So this is one of the advantages of doing a book study, is you come to one of these, and you'd love to just skip over it, but it's like we can't, we can't just go from Mark 12 last week to Mark 14 next week without you noticing. So we have to cover Mark 13 too, right? So we're going to do it right now. It's going to be fun. Verse 1 of Mark 13 says this, As Jesus was... Leaving the temple that day, Jesus has just taught in the temple for the last time. His disciples don't know that, but of course Jesus does. They're now leaving the temple that day. And one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at these impressive stones in the walls. These are some of the stones that made up the foundation below the temple. We don't have any of the stones from the temple because the Romans completely destroyed that in 70 A.D., but we do have the foundation platform below the temple on which that was built. And these stones that you see here are called ashlar stones. Some of them are 500 tons in weight. A million pounds. More than a fully loaded 747 airplane. These could be like 40 feet long, 10 feet high, 8 to 10 feet width, uh, thick. Some of the biggest ones, they weren't all that way. Some of them were much smaller, but some of them were just massive, impressive stones. And that's what the disciples were looking at. 
And of course, we can't see what the temple itself looks like today, but we can see a model of it. This is a model in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And you can see a depiction of what this probably looked like based on the reports we have about it. One of those reports comes from a man named Josephus. He was a Jewish historian who wrote about what the temple looked like, and here's what he said. Now the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing that was likely to surprise either men's mind or their eyes, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight, and at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away just as they would have done at the sun's own rays." But this temple appeared to strangers when they were at distance like a mountain covered with snow. For as to those parts that were not gilt, that's covered in gold, they were exceedingly white. Of its stones, some of them were 45 cubits in length, five in height, and six in breadth. So this was an impressive structure. But remember back to Mark chapter 12. We've been studying that for the last few weeks. Remember what the disciples have just learned about before this moment. The corruption of the temple leaders. The importance of being just and honest as religious leaders. Warnings that Jesus gave about the religious leaders and and how they cared mostly about outward appearances. What matters most, he said, is to love God and to love others. And everything else flows from that. You can look religious without loving God and loving others. But you can't love God and love others without eventually following God's commands. It's supposed to all flow from that. And so after hearing all of this, they walk outside of the temple, and they look up at this building, which they've seen before, and the only thing on their minds is, man, this is an impressive building. This is really cool, Jesus. This is great. And I have to imagine, do you think that Jesus ever did a face palm? Do you think that Jesus ever listened to his disciples and went, come on, guys, seriously? Like, really? I just spent all this time telling you why that whole system is corrupt. I just spent all this time teaching you that these leaders and the temple system and everything about this and caring all about appearances on the outside, all of that stuff, that's not what God wants. That's not what I want. That's not what any of this is all about. That is corrupted now. And yet here the disciples are saying, man, look at this place. This is awesome. This is amazing. It's so impressive. And so Jesus replied in verse 2, yes, Yes, look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. And just try to put yourself into the mind of a first century Jewish person hearing this. Think about this. The temple was everything to them. The temple was their source of political and religious pride. This was the best thing they had going for them was the temple. In fact, the Jewish people and the Romans and everybody knew if it was ever going to be a revolt that was going to overthrow Rome, it was probably going to start at the temple. And that's why there was a fort right next to it where the Romans could watch over it. And if there ever was anything that even looked like a revolt, they would come in there with their army and squash it because that's probably where it was going to start. This was a big deal. And for Jesus to say the temple is going to be completely demolished, that was huge. It would be like somebody telling you that the the Capitol building and the Statue of Liberty and all of our monuments were going to be destroyed soon. I mean, that would be a national disgrace. And that's what Jesus was talking about. And so these guys, they couldn't get out of their minds. And later on, some of them came up to Jesus to talk about this. Look at verse 3. Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? So here's an overview of what this looks like, the old city of Jerusalem. And I want to show you right over here is where the Mount of Olives is. This is the Kidron Valley, and Jesus was looking over the valley at the temple right there. That's the temple that we saw earlier from the model, just flipped to the other side now. And Jesus is sitting there. This is what it looks like today. So this is sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking over at the temple compound. Now, of course, the Dome of the Rock is there in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, but this is where the temple would have been. Jesus is sitting here, and four of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were part of the inner circle, and Andrew was with them as well, these four guys couldn't get it out of their mind that Jesus said the temple's going to be destroyed. And so they came up to them, and they wanted to know, give us some more details. Tell us when this is going to happen. Tell us what is going on here. They asked for two things, a date and a sign. 
a date and a sign. When will the temple be destroyed? And what is the sign that it's going to happen? And they probably asked about this because they connected this with the restoration of the Israelite kingdom. And that's, so that's one of the things that they're thinking is whenever this happens, the temple's going to be destroyed, Jesus has got to be talking about the restoration of the kingdom. So we want to know when this is going to happen. But another reason they probably asked about this is because whatever was going to come through and wipe out this temple was a dangerous thing. I mean, we're probably talking about an army here, which is exactly what happened. Some four years later, the Romans came through and demolished the thing. Every stone thrown down. And so whatever that thing is, we don't want to be around when it comes through. So Jesus, give us a date. When, the, when is this going to happen? Tell us. And what's the sign so that we know when we see this, we can get out of here. And what follows in chapter 13, the rest of the verses here, 33 more verses, is the longest answer Jesus ever gives to a question he's asked in the Bible. It is the longest answer Jesus gives, and it is the most complex and the most confusing and one of the most controversial passages in Scripture. And we're going to look at the whole thing today. Are you ready for this? This is going to be awesome. It's a confusing passage. It seems like it jumps back and forth at times between talking about the destruction of the temple and talking about other future events. So it's kind of hard to figure some of these things out. Jesus uses broad prophetic language here. He doesn't give all the specific details and nuances that curious minds like mine would like to know. I'd really like to understand a lot more of this, but he doesn't, he doesn't give all of that. He leaves it pretty, pretty vague, pretty mysterious, pretty confusing, frankly. And I've studied the end times a lot. It's fascinating stuff. But you know, the more I've studied end times and prophecies and all those things and tried to fit all the pieces together and read different theories and approaches to all of this, the more I've studied that, the more I've learned this basic truth. That biblical prophecy about the future is less about predicting future events and more about learning to trust the one who holds the future. Biblical prophecy is less about us being able to predict the future and more about us learning to trust the one who holds the future. In fact, I don't believe that Jesus gives all the information we're about to go through. Lots and lots of stuff. We'll see in just a minute. I don't believe he's giving all this information primarily so that the disciples can have a blueprint for what the future is going to look like. He doesn't give them enough for that. I think there's another reason why Jesus is sharing this with them, and that's what I want to challenge you to look for today. As we read this together, we're going to study it together, I want you to take a step back, try to see the big picture, and don't just ask the common questions that we often get kind of wrapped up in, which is the what and the how. What exactly is going to happen? How exactly is it going to happen? And in sometimes even the when is it going to happen? But what I want you to do is ask the question, why? Why did Jesus share this information with his disciples? Why did Jesus share this and not more? And I think as we work through this together, you will start to see some patterns that will help us to understand what is more important to Jesus than us having a blueprint for the future is learning to trust him and focus on what he wants us to focus on, and we'll see that as we go through this passage. So in order to do this, I provided you with an outline. It's on the back of your weekly program. And if you want to get up and grab one of these, it's not going to offend me. They're in the back probably. If there's still more back there, you can pick up one of these. It's got a full outline on the back. There's an outline uh, of this passage. Two of these points we've covered already. So I'm just going to, now that I've explained it, sort of give you them afterwards so you can fill them in. Because I know some of you with your outlines, you've got to get every line filled in, right? Who, who are you out there? You just, I've got to fill this all in. Yes, thank you. I see those hands. Verses 1 through 2. The temple will be destroyed. That's the first section of this chapter. Verses 1 through 2, the temple will be destroyed. In verses 3 and 4, four disciples ask two questions. Now, we're going to read through Jesus' entire answer. And we'll stop along the way just to sort of note each section as they're broken apart and sort of a summary of what that section is all about. And remember, as we do this, what did disciples ask for? Two things, a date and a sign. Give us a date and a sign. Verse 5, read along with me. Jesus replied, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. 
and you hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines, but this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. And so this first section we're going to say is a warning about false messiahs and false signs of the end times. Followers of Jesus, after this point, will repeatedly encounter situations that they make them think that the end of the world is at hand. And this is exactly what happens. That the end has come, that judgment is near. Some of them will even try to predict it. And so there's the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And there's the rise of the church and, and what all that looks like in its different forms. And that made some people think that the end must be near. There's World War I and World War II and all these other, other events that have made people think, man, this has got to be it, you know? People thought that Hitler was the Antichrist. People thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. I mean, everybody gets labeled the Antichrist at some point, I guess. With Ronald Reagan, here's how it worked. So Ronald... Wilson, Reagan. Each of those names has six letters. Six, six, six. He must be the Antichrist. That is not a joke. That's just, that's just fact. People thought that. Jesus warned about false messiahs who would come. False, false messiahs who would come and claim to come in his name. And what do we have over the last couple thousand years? Cult after cult after cult that has come claiming to be in Jesus' name. They want you to think desperately that they are Christians. They'll use Christian terminology. They'll try to make it sound like, yep, I, I follow the same God, I do the same stuff. They come in Jesus' name. Some of them will even go so far as to say, we are actually restoring the kind of Christianity that Jesus was all about that the rest of the church, the rest of the world has gotten away from. And so we're the true church, and they bring in all these kinds of new teachings that are not found in the Bible, but it's extra stuff that they claim is actually what God wants to communicate with us. And what are they really doing? They are bringing in a false version of the good news, of the gospel. They are adding more to it. They are saying that instead of it being fully trusting on God, there's all the stuff you have to do. And oftentimes it involves giving money. You've got to give money and rise through the ranks and do these other things and accomplish all this stuff, and then you'll be right with God. And it's cults, but they claim to be coming in Jesus' name. Verse 9. When these things begin to happen, watch out. You will be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. For the good news must first be preached to all the nations. But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time, for it is not you who will be speaking but the Holy Spirit. A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. And children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And everyone will hate you. Everyone will hate you. Because you are my followers, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this section we're going to say is a warning about coming persecution and trouble. A warning about coming persecution and trouble. Contrary to what you often hear on TV, Jesus did not come here to save you so that you could just have an awesome life and everything would be easy and wonderful. And I know we often hear things like that. But Jesus did not come here to save you so that you could have the house you want and the car you want and the, the money you want and the vacations you want and the guy or the girl you want. I know that's a lot of what we hear out there, but that is not at all what Jesus shared with his disciples. Jesus didn't say it was going to be easy. And there are people who will preach a false version of the gospel. How many of you have heard of something called the prosperity gospel? Who's heard of the prosperity gospel? Sometimes it's called the health and wealth gospel. And the idea here is that God's mission really is for you to be as healthy as you can be and have all the money you need and want. And that's really what God wants for you. And if you don't have those things, by the way, it's because of one of two things. Number one, you probably don't have enough faith. So you need to just believe really hard. And number two, you probably haven't given enough money yet to the person who's preaching this so that God can bless you in response to that gift. It's called the prosperity gospel. It's a health and wealth gospel. And guess what? Jesus' disciples never heard a message like that. 
They never heard a version of the gospel that ended that way. Because what did Jesus tell them? You will face struggles. You will be put on trial. You will face persecution. You will have incredible times of hardship and anguish for following me. This was not at all a prosperity, health, and wealth gospel. There were difficult times ahead for Jesus' followers. And in fact, today, over 200 million Christians around the world live in persecution, actively physically persecuted. Over 200 million, 215 million is the estimate right now. Over 200 million Christians living in persecution right now. We are so blessed, let's not take it for granted, that we do not face that right now in this country. That could change. Jesus did not promise that if you're his follower, life is going to be easy. He actually promised the opposite. It's going to make things tough. It's going to make things hard for you. And he wants them to know that. Read on. In verse 14, the day is coming when you will see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration. That is sometimes called the abomination of desolation. Can you say that back to me? That's really good because you didn't know you were going to have to remember that. And you just nailed it. So good job. The Abomination of Desolation, which sounds like working title of the next Avengers movie. It's got kind of a cool epic ring to it. There are all sorts of theories about what that might be, but this sacrilegious object or abomination of desolation standing where he should not be. And then he says, reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to peck. Their houses were flat on top and had railings around them. So you could go up and it was like another level of the house. So on the deck of a roof must not go down to peck. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter for there will be greater anguish in those days than at any time since God created the world and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless the Lord shortens that time of calamity, not a single person will survive, but for the sake of his chosen ones, he has shortened those days. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. In this section, you may have noticed a trend now in your fill-ins, We're going to call warning about the coming abomination and the need to flee. There will be anguish so great it has never been that terrible before and will never be that terrible after. And thankfully God will limit how long this can be or no one would survive. And again, there will be false prophets, false messiahs trying to deceive people, trying to deceive even God's people if they are able to do so. Verse 23. Jesus says, Watch out. I have warned you about this ahead of time. At that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man. That's a term for the Messiah. This refers to Jesus. Everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. And we're going to differ from our format a little bit. This, area is, this section is going to be called Promise that the Messiah will return for God's people. This is a promise that the Messiah will return for God's people. I'm sure you've noticed as we've started working through this passage that there are many, many fascinating and difficult questions that it raises. And we're barely going to touch on some of those today. It's probably the type of thing that's better for a smaller group discussion because of all the different roads we can take with some of these nuances and really, really challenging, difficult questions. But there is one thing I want to draw your attention to in this section that I think is really interesting. And that is in verse 27. He will send out his angels... That's referring to the Son of Man, the Messiah, Jesus. It's referring to the angels as being Jesus' angels, as in Jesus has the authority over the angels to do this, to send them out. Not send out God's angels, send out his angels, Jesus' angels. It speaks to the authority and the power and even the deity of Jesus Christ, which is really neat. 
Now verse 28. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree, Jesus says. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. Summer's right around the corner. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return, the Son of Man, Jesus, the Messiah's return, is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass from scene before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will not disappear. See, when you see the fig tree start to bud, when you see the leaves show up, you know that summer is imminent. It is near. It's right around the corner. You can know that this, these things are about to happen. You shouldn't delay. You shouldn't put off. You shouldn't waste time because you know this is about to happen. And what Jesus is sharing here is that when these, these details that he is talking about start to happen, you need to be aware. You need to get ready because you're kind of in the last days. You need to understand that when some of these things start to happen, you can't slouch off. You have to be ready. You have to be prepared. You have to live your life in the knowledge that this stuff could just about happen. And a lot of these things that Jesus is talking about have happened already. The wars and rumors of wars, the false messiahs being put on trial, persecution, false religions. And all of that doesn't mean that we can know the end will happen tomorrow. But it means we can't act like the end isn't going to happen for a long time. That's what he's trying to communicate here. And so the warning that Jesus gives is, since some of these things here have already happened and happened shortly after Jesus left, you have to operate as if he could come back at any time. And what will you be doing with your life when he does? He's saying, always be ready. Always be ready. And so this section, we say, is a warning that these events are imminent. These events are imminent. It's a warning. Verse 32, the last section of this chapter, says, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or even the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard. Stay alert The coming of the Son of Man, again, that's the Messiah, can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves or bondservants instructions about the work they were to do, and he told the the gatekeeper to watch for his return. You too must keep watch, for you don't know when the master of the household will return, in the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone, Watch for him. And you've probably figured out by now the pattern of the fill-ins and exactly where we're going with this. This is a warning to be ready. A warning to be ready. Don't think that you can predict when this is going to happen. Don't assume that it's going to happen right away because there will be many false signs of this. But don't just think that it's going to be a long ways off. You need to live your life and behave in such a way as if Jesus could come back at any moment and what is he going to find you doing with your life when he does? Now this is a very complex and difficult passage. Amen? It's true. Thank you, because I've been studying this for a couple weeks. And man, it is a difficult, challenging passage to work through. And many godly and faithful scholars have come to very different conclusions about what some of the things mean in this chapter. We're not going to try to solve all of that today. I mean, what parts of this are talking about the destruction of the temple versus talking about some other future events or the return of Christ? Where exactly does the rapture and tribulation fit into all of this? What does it mean that Jesus doesn't know the time of these events? How is that possible? And we could spend an hour talking about all the, the theories and the and ways all of that makes sense and, and where my view on, is on it. That's not the, the point today. But this chapter raises a lot of interesting questions. What is meant by saying that this generation will not pass away before all these events take place? There are, there are good reasons for all these things. And we have, we have good, good theories about what Jesus means by all of this. But I, I want to present to you today two thoughts that I think help us to step back and maybe see the big picture. And really think about more of our our thoughts and and speculation about the end times in general. And the first thing I want to share with you is this. I think it's important 
when we read things like this about the future that we can't fully understand or know all the details, that we remember the buckets of belief. Remember the Undivided series. We talked about four buckets, and if you haven't seen that, go back on our website. Look for the Undivided series. Watch that. Four buckets, dogma, doctrine, conviction, and preference. And I think we can probably all agree that most of the things we might divide over in this chapter about how exactly is this going to happen, when, and where, and what's this going to look like, most of those things fit comfortably in the conviction bucket. And we should not make them into doctrine or dogma. There are many of these types of things that are worth studying and discussing, but not worth arguing and dividing over. There are lots of things like that that are worth studying, they're worth discussing, but they're not worth arguing or dividing over. You might believe that the abomination of desolation we talked about earlier, the sacrilegious object, you might believe the fulfillment of that was when Romans came in in 70 AD and tore down the temple and then set up emperor worship all over that area. Maybe that's the abomination of desolation. Or you might believe that it's the Dome of the Rock that now sits in the place where the temple once stood. Or you might believe that in a future temple there's going to be an idol that will be set up. Or you might believe that in a future temple there's going to be a sacrifice of a pig on an altar in the temple. Or maybe some of you don't really know and don't really care. Is anyone in that camp? You're just like, I have no idea. I don't know what he's talking about. You have no opinion at all. And here's my message for you. That's okay. Because I don't think that Jesus' purpose in sharing with this with us was for us to just absolutely nail exactly how it's going to happen and to completely predict and know what's going to happen. It's fascinating to talk about. It's interesting to study. It's great to study. But some things are worth studying and discussing but not worth arguing and dividing over. It's okay to have different views and opinions and even to say, I don't really know. I am more confused now than when I started reading this book. This thing is, wow. Wow. Okay, that's not what it's all about. And the second thought that I want to share with you, I think this could be really key for some people. The second thought I want to share with you is that the mystery and vagueness in this chapter that we just read, all of that mystery and vagueness is just like the mystery and vagueness that the Old Testament Israelite would have had concerning the, the prophecies about Messiah. Think about that. The confusion that we have when we look at this passage is not unlike at all the confusion that they had when they looked at the prophecies about the Messiah. So consider this. They had specific enough information that when they look back in hindsight, we can see, and they can see if they're willing to do this, some do, that yes, these prophecies all point to this man, Jesus. They have enough information that they can look back and say, yes, this lines up, these prophecies speak of Jesus, but they did not have enough information that they could predict exactly when or how or where it would happen. They could get some general ideas. They could make some educated guesses. But could they really nail it down and predict exactly what was going to happen? Where he was going to be born and how and to who and what that was going to look like and the shepherds and all of that stuff? No, they didn't have enough information to to put together a blueprint for it, but in hindsight, they can look back and go, wow, that's exactly right. That's exactly what those prophecies were about because God gave them enough information through the prophets to give them hope, to point them toward the future instead of focusing on the past, to get them ready for something ahead. It was a glimpse of the future, but don't forget that a glimpse is intentionally incomplete. A glimpse does not have all of the information, and that is on purpose. Moses actually warned the Israelites about this when he had them all together. He gathered them all together at one point and he kind of gave them a speech and he taught them some things he wanted them to know. And here's one of the things that he shared. This is from Deuteronomy 29. He said, The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them. We are not accountable for them. But we and our children are are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. There are things in God's word that he hints at, things that give us hope, things that point us to the future and looking forward, the promise of a necessary judgment, the promise of an unbelievably better future for those that trust in God. And then there are many things that God has not explicitly revealed to us. He has not shared all of the details in the ways that we would like him to share all of the details. And if our obsession with those future things becomes a distraction from our mission, then we've missed the point of why God shared them in the first place. 
I want to show that to you. This is what Jesus told his disciples after he rose from the dead and he spent some time with them. In Acts chapter 1, the apostles were with Jesus and they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdoms? This is still on their minds. And here's what he says. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times and they are not for you to know. Now he gave them a glimpse of it. They had some information, but they wanted it more. They kept wanting more. And Jesus said, that is not for you to know right now. That is just some information that that we're not willing to give you. But then he redirects them. Look at this in the next verse. This is where he goes from. So don't worry about the specifics of what's going to happen in the future. And then listen to this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What is Jesus saying? Knowing the future has become a distraction for you. It's a distraction from you. Instead, focus on the mission. This is where I want your minds to go. Not worrying constantly about what's going to happen down the road, but what do I have for you to do now? Look back at your outline. Look at your outline. What do you see? Warning, 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 promise, warning, warning. But I just want a date and a sign, God. I just want to know the specifics. I just want to know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. But warning, warning. Warning, bad times are coming. Stay on guard. Stay alert. Don't let your guard down. Don't let him find you sleeping. What does Jesus mean by that? What is he looking for from his disciples? What does he want them to do? He wants them to focus on their mission. He wants them to focus on what he's been preparing them for all along. And so what he's saying essentially is this. Don't get distracted from the mission. Be focused. Be ready. Don't get distracted from the mission. Be focused. Be ready at all times. No matter what you're going to face, no matter what you're going to experience, all the persecution, all these crazy things, don't be distracted by this. Stay on guard. Watch out. Be alert. It's a warning, warning, warning. Stay focused on the mission that I have for you. And what was that mission? Go back to verse 9. The second half of verse 9 in Mark 13 says this, you will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me, for the good news must first be preached to all nations. That's what he's preparing them for. That's what he's going to send them out to do. And later on in Matthew 28, he says this, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He brings it around full circle. You see, there will be an end. There will be a judgment. There will be the return of Christ that is coming. The details around that are fascinating to study and even speculate about. But the mission is what matters most. The mission of loving God with everything you have, heart, soul, strength, and mind. The mission of loving others as yourself. And what is the most loving thing you can do for something, for someone? It's to share with them the good news about Jesus. That's a mission that we've been talking about these last few weeks. The mission that Jesus prepared his disciples to do. And here that he told his disciples, I want you to go make more disciples and then teach those disciples to do everything I've commanded you which, by the way, includes that command of going and making more disciples. That's what we're supposed to be about. That's the mission. Don't get distracted from the mission. Be focused. Be ready. So I have a question for you. Jesus was preparing his disciples for this mission. He told them not to get distracted. Last week, Kevin talked about God is preparing you for what he's prepared for you. So what is threatening to distract you from the mission God has prepared you for. What is threatening to distract you from the mission God has prepared you for? Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he planned for us long ago. James 4.17 says, remember, it is a sin to know to do good and then not to do it. There are good things God has prepared us to do. What is distracting us from doing the mission that God has prepared us for? What are those distractions? For some of you, it might be an obsession with the end times. Probably not. 
That was a huge distraction back in, in Jesus' day. That was a big focus. Everybody wanted to know about the restoration of the kingdom. When's the end going to happen? How's it all going to work? But your obsession might be with another aspect of theology. It could, it could be some kind of a theological framework that has sort of absorbed all of your thinking and your time so much so that you can't even remember the last time you told someone about Jesus, but you can tell me the books that you've read and the, the authors that you've been following and all of that stuff. Focus on the mission. What's distracting you might be money. It could be debt. It could be the bills that have to be paid. It could be the pursuit of the almighty dollar. It could be everything surrounding money that's become a distraction to you. What's distracting you could be a relationship. An unhealthy relationship with someone who keeps drawing you back into old habits. And it's become a distraction for you from the mission that God has for you. Maybe your distraction is the next temporary pleasure that is right in front of you. The next high. The next hit. The next dopamine rush the next win, the next jackpot, whatever it is that is consistently taking your thoughts away from God and what he wants you to do, that is the distraction that is keeping you from accomplishing the mission that God has been preparing you for and that he has prepared for you. I want you to think for a moment. Are there any distractions in my life that are keeping me from fulfilling God's mission for me? And while you do that, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads so no one's looking around, so we can just focus. Pray and ask God, Lord, is there anything that has become a distraction from what you want me to do? Prayer team, you can come forward now. Is there anything, God, that has become a distraction from the mission that you have for me? And whatever that is, if there's something that God is revealing to you and saying, hey, this is something that has really gotten a hold of your life, it's keeping you from doing the things that you know I want you to do. Then give that over to him. Say, God, would you help me? Would you help me to remove this distraction? To, to cut out the excuses? Help me, Lord, to focus and be disciplined on the good things you have prepared me to do and to not let any excuse or distraction get in the way of that. Lord, help me to do the things that you have prepared for me to do. You, you can... You can keep praying if you want to, or you can look up here for a minute if you want to. I'm just going to give you one final thought. We don't have a closing song today. If you want to come up here and pray with someone, we would love for you to do that. But here's my encouragement to you. The best thing you can do now, if there is some distraction that God has revealed to you in your life, the best thing you can do is share that with someone who can help keep you accountable and who can pray for you. And so maybe that's a person who's right around you, Maybe that is someone uh, who is in a small group or an accountability partner or someone else. But I encourage you, I challenge you to share that distraction with someone else. Ask them to pray for you. And if you need someone to do that right now, come forward and we would love to pray for you after, after we close. Let me pray for you right now. God, thank you for your church. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the message that you have for us in your word. Sometimes it is so challenging to read through this and try to make heads and tails of some of it. And yet you gave it to us for a reason. And it does teach us incredible principles that we need to latch onto and absorb and apply in our life. And we, part, part of that is we just need to trust that you hold the future, Lord. And we don't have to know exactly how all of that is going to play out, but we trust you for it. And so help us now to live out the mission that you have for us, even not knowing everything we might want to know about what's going to happen in the future. Help us this week to be focused on the mission that you have prepared for us, on the people and the situations and the good things that are going to be right in front of us. Help us to be disciplined in doing those things and following through with them and grow us as we do that, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a great week.